This is our, I believe, fifth session of how to read the Bible. And this morning we're going to start, as we do normally, with prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we come together today with the single purpose and desire to know you better. And so, Lord, we know that the way that that is done is through knowing your word, which expresses your character and your will and what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us the tools that I have long since been neglected, that we would be ones who would be those who would tremble at your word and also understand what it means and how it applies to our lives. So be with us this morning, we pray, and help us in Christ's name. Amen. There is a verse in Luke 2, 6 through 7. It says, while they were there, the time came for her child to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Would the proper deduction or interpretation from that, uh, those two verses be, my baby should sleep in a crib? Yes or no? No answers given here. Keep that thought in mind as we keep going on here. We are now venturing from the epistles to the Old Testament narratives, the Old Testament stories. And most of the Old Testament, three quarters of the Old Testament, is narrative. It is stories. It's Hebrew narrative, which is different from the narrative being written today. And it's the most common type of literature in the Bible. We must remember as Christians that the Old Testament is our spiritual history. It's not irrelevant. And the promises of calling, the calling of God to Israel are our historical promises in calling. The church has been referred to in the New Testament as the Israel of God. And remember, one of the cardinal principles is that you read from the text up rather than reading in to the text. You want to be exegetical not eisegetical. Now, these are stories, and they retell historical events. They intend to give us meaning and direction for us in the present, not only them back then, but us, us as well. These are God's stories. This is what happened. And if you know, every story has a character or characters, has a plot, and it has a plot resolution if it's a good story. The primary person of a story is called what? Major. The protagonist. The one who brings conflict or tension in the story is called the, the antagonist. And those who are involved in the struggle are called the agonists. So you'll see in the Bible stories that there's always a protagonist, there's an antagonist, and there are agonists. There's a plot of the entire biblical story that God created a people of image bearers to be stewards of the earth he created them uh, for their benefit and for them to bring honor and glory to him. And then came the antagonist, Satan. 
He came in and provoked corruption of the image bearing. And we, ladies and gentlemen, are the agonists, the ones that suffer, aren't we? And the Christ will come back, the hero of the story. He is the hero. He is always the hero. Now remember, there's three levels of stories in the Bible. There's what's called the meta-narrative. It's the big picture, the big story. And of course, the big story is redemption, what we just said. And then there is the next level down, which is the Old Covenant and New Covenant stories. And then the first level is the actual stories. Don't forget, when Jesus referred to the Old Testament in John 5.39, he said, these are the scriptures that testify about me. So if you don't see Jesus in the Old Testament, you're not reading the Old Testament correctly. Now, what Old Testament narratives are not? They are not allegories. And people allegorize them all the time. This means this. This means this. This is symbolic for this. This is this. This is this. And they come up with meanings that were never intended by those who wrote the stories. Despite what we did in Sunday school, if you've been here long enough with flannelographs, remember? We used to take flannel stuff and stick it on things and put little characters before there were videos and all that stuff. This is back in the 80s. We used to use them to directly teach moral lessons. And they do not directly teach moral lessons. Bear with me. In the Old Testament often illustrates what is taught categorically and explicitly elsewhere. How we're going to do that is we're going to camp out this morning on another narrative, a narrative, and it's, uh, I'd like you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is probably a familiar story to you, I would imagine. But from it, we're going to illustrate the principles that we're talking about. 2 Samuel 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Now, right there, you're saying, oh, that doesn't look good. The king does not go out with the army. He's home and he's idle. It happened. What happened? Late one afternoon, when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba? Or if you're Hebrew, Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. No punches being pulled there, right? Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. 
When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, You remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall, so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Uriah, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Job had sent to, sent to tell him. The messenger said to David, The man gained an advantage over us, and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when she was, when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, <clears throat> never in this narrative do you hear the principle, adultery is wrong. You never hear the principle, murder is wrong. You are expected to know that because it is taught somewhere else in the Bible, namely in the Ten Commandments and other places. It's taught explicitly. The narrative is illustrating the harmful consequences of adultery in the personal life of King David and his ability to rule. After this event, if we kept reading, we would find that the rest of David's life was not blessed as the first part. And so he paid a heavy price. And people that engage in adultery pay a heavy price, a lifelong price. That's why we have so much divorce. 
The narrative does not systematically teach you about adultery and could not be used as the sole basis for such teaching. But as one illustration of the effects of adultery in a particular case, it conveys a powerful message that you do not forget, whether you are male or female, and it can imprint itself on your heart and mind if you're a careful reader and you read it the way it's intended. Now let's just go through it and pick up little kernels of truth, right? The first issue is David is idle. He's not working. He's got no job. He's laying on his couch in the afternoon eating bonbons. <laughs> and so when he's not doing anything, he's bored, he goes outside and he happens to see a woman bathing. You'll, men and women will see each other in certain ways, um, you know, in, on the beach, uh, in the marketplace, uh, at school, at church, but not in a way where they see him, if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Uh, and so David here had nothing going on in his life, and he probably took that second glance. He sees that there's a woman there, and she's naked, and he sees that she's beautiful, and then he takes the next step. See temptation? taking him in piece by piece, step by step, setting the trap for David, right? Guys, military men couldn't take David down, but as the lusts of his heart could, basically is how it goes. So what does he do? He tries to find, he doesn't know who she is. It's like, it's like seeing somebody and going on Facebook after, and who is this person? You know, are they married? What do they look like in, you know, the context? What do they do for a living, right? But in this case, he doesn't have Facebook, so he's finding out about her. And then he takes the next step, and he's the king. So he says, come here, come see me. And she just purified herself from her uncleanness. And if you're a woman, I believe your fertility is 14 days after your, the end of your period, right? Is that right, ladies? Usually, usually. So this woman is dangerous in terms of, you know, she's ready to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. And so, two willing participants, the husband's at war, she's feeling down, he's alone, probably feels like a failure because he's not with his men, he's bored. And then we go against the king. And he's, and he's lusting in his heart. And so now he's got a problem. I am pregnant. You know, guys that do these things don't want to hear those words. And it's a big deal because whose baby is that? Is it the product of adultery? So David takes a step further. He goes further into the deception and he says, bring Uriah over here and we'll have him lay with his wife very close to when I did. So people will say, yeah, it's Uriah's kid. It's somebody else's kid. I can't tell you how many stories in 34 years of practicing law that someone who thought their father was their father wasn't their father, you know? Um, so here he tried to do this ruse and Uriah is the honorable man, right? He says, I can't do that. I got people under me, they're in battle. I'm not going to go in and have a vacation with my wife. I got no head for that. And then, he, then David goes a step further. Let's get him drunk, right? Then we'll get him straightened out. He gets drunk, he'll probably do it. He gets him drunk, he doesn't do it. So now David goes to the third step and says, go into battle. We'll make this look good. Go into battle, get into a big fight and then withdraw from the guy so he's a sitting duck. He's going to get killed, right? Because he's saying, if he gets killed, then I'll marry her. That's basically what happens. So he gets killed, 
And you would think that David, because this, this is so foolish of a thing to do in battle. David was a smart warrior. He knew battle, right? Here's the guy that sl slayed Goliath with five smooth stones. Uh, he, he knew the Lord and he knew battle. So what does he do? He says, oh, yeah, don't worry about Uriah dying. That was too bad. Yeah, pretty sad situation. So he then takes Bathsheba and uh, she becomes his wife. But you hear at the end one, if I can say, pregnant verse, pregnant with meaning. It says, but the thing that David did displeased the Lord. If I was a Puritan preacher, that would be my only text. But the thing that David did displeased the Lord. So you see all these different principles you can derive from this, but it's not telling you directly what adultery is. It's not telling you directly what temptation is. It's not telling you directly what lust is. We all know what murder is. We're not, uh, it's not telling us about deception and lying and fraud and all those types of things. We're supposed to be truth tellers, but it's illustrating it perfectly, isn't it? And it's a wonderful section to preach because it's so relevant for the modern day, isn't it? It's entirely relevant for the modern day. Um, but it would be hard to derive, you know, one principle from it or one, pro pro you know, proposition from it. You got to get that from Exodus 20, 14. You shall not commit adultery. And this will give you the backstory, male or female, of why you shouldn't. What happens to the kid? The kid dies. What happens to David's life after? It gets terrible right so that's that's a narrative that's a story you know and we can't teach that to kids i don't think um very well because it's kind of a mature content but um let's take i don't know if we can do this in the time that we have but we can take a shot at it in Genesis, there's a huge story of Joseph. It occupies a lot of Genesis. It goes from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50. And maybe if we could just draw the, the, what do you call it, the high points from it, that might be enough to kind of teach what we're saying here about narratives. Just go to Genesis 37. And this is big. Just like last week with Ruth and Boaz, if Ruth and Boaz didn't happen in the right way, the Christ, humanly speaking, would not have come and we would still be in our sins. You know what I mean? And the same thing applies to Genesis 37 through 50, although it's never said once in this entire huge narrative. Never said once. Does everybody know the story? If you don't know it, that's your homework. Read Genesis 37 through 50. I can't read the whole thing because I'll be out of breath and out of out of time so it's joseph joseph's got a dream you know he's like martin luther king i have a dream i have a dream today Joseph jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of canine canaan yeah canine canaan these are the generations of jacob joseph being 17 years old was pasturing the flock with his brothers he was a boy with the sons of bilhah and zilpha his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, here's the first problem. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons 
because he was the son of his old age. How many know that playing favorites in a family is a bad thing? And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have had dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered round and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dream and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream, and it told it to his brothers, and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Even if you have these great dreams, it might be wise to hold on to them, right? <laughs> Rather than tell people, because they're going to get jealous, and that's exactly what they did. So you know the story. They plotted to kill him. And when they plotted to kill him, they didn't have the nerve to go through with it, so they threw him in a hole. And when he was thrown in a hole, some guys that were journeying down to Egypt picked him up and sold him as a slave and brought him to Egypt. And when he was in Egypt, he was in prison. And because Joseph was a quality guy, he distinguished himself everywhere. And he was trusted by people in charge. Ultimately, he was trusted by the Pharaoh to be a servant in the Pharaoh's own home. And then it happens again. Potiphar says, hey, baby, you're looking real good. And he says, no, I can't do that. He isn't, he runs, but before he runs, he says, I can't do that. Potiphar, I mean, um, um, Potiphar's charge, you know, put me in charge of all this stuff. And he's trusting, he's trusting me to be this great guy and all this stuff. And so I, I can't do that. I can't dishonor my Lord. So he runs, but he leaves something behind, a piece of clothing or whatever. And so anyway, the blame gets pinned on him, and um, he gets in trouble, and he interprets some dreams. He's a dreamer. He interprets some dreams. They have a, a famine in Egypt, and they have a famine in Goshen, where all the Hebrews are, up north, right? And so Joseph says, this is what it means. This is from the Lord. This is what you've got to do to survive through the famine. So they listened to him. I'm giving you the basic overview from my memory, okay? And so they listened to him. They, they institute the measures that he says. And Egypt is doing quite well. They get through the famine. They have food. They had stored it up when everything was going well. And um, they had the granaries were full. And they opened the granaries. And people were eating. And the Hebrews up there in Goshen, one, were sad because Joseph, the son, was dead, they thought, and also because they were starving to death. So what do they do? They go down to Egypt. Who also went down to Egypt? No, before, later. This is a foreshadowing of what happens. Who goes down to Egypt? Christ. Christ goes down to Egypt when the edict is given to kill all the babies. He's driven into Egypt to survive. And when, it, when the thing is done, when the period of time passed, 
The Bible says, out of Egypt, I called my son. So you see, this stuff is all interlocked. It's beautifully interlocked. It's amazingly. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You see how these things happen? They couldn't just happen. Behind the story, there's a narrator. Even though Moses is writing this, who's the narrator really? Jesus. No. Who's the narrator writing this? I guess you could say Jesus is the correct answer, but who's really the narrator? God. God's the narrator. We'll just put it that way. God's the narrator, and the the Bible scholars call him the omniscient narrator because there are things in the narration that only God could know. Like we just read, the thing that David done had displeased the Lord, right? How would we know what it displeased the Lord? You know, but the omniscient narrator is involved here. So God behind the human author is narrating the story and telling you he is everywhere and he knows everything about the story he tells. He's responsible for the point of view. Sometimes he discloses things directly. <clears throat> the Lord was with Joseph. Or he does it through characters. And then you see in this thing, scenes, right? You can make a play of this. There's scenes in the beginning. Scenes, 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 right? You can make sets from the scenes. And you see um, the physical characteristics of the characters who are germane to the plot. Joseph, you know, he's a strapping man and he's, uh, he's smart and he's... Uh, He's a bit uh, confident, you know, and he has a dream. And you see some own, you see some nefarious characters like Potiphar's wife. She alone at home uh, has got too much time on her hands, just like David had too much time on his. And uh, that illustrates the old axiom, an idle mind is the devil's playground. Amen. Right? But the first point of dialogue is often a significant clue, and this is no exception. Uh, verses 5 through 11 say, hey, you guys are all going to bow down to me. I'm going to be the prince of Egypt. I oh, really think you're going to be that. At the end of the story in Genesis 50, what happens? They all come, bow down, beg for grain. He saves them. Then he discloses that he's Joseph, and they all freak out. Everybody's... There isn't a dry eye anywhere. But what's the whole point of the story? Don't hang out with somebody's wife alone in their house. That's not it. Don't tell people your dreams. That's not it. What's the whole point of this overarching narrative? Can I give it to you? Here it is. And this huge story that teaches a hundred other things, but it's teaching you this, that God was going to save his people and in so doing he would go to any length through the workings of humanity to preserve his chosen people so that the Christ would be born the God-man and save his true covenant people. You see that? Same thing with Ruth and Boaz, right? That God's going to have himself a people and he'll do anything. And he's behind all the actors, even their sins, right? He ordains everything that comes to pass. Everything. We're going to talk about that in Sunday school on Sunday. You need to show up for that, the sovereignty of God. You need to know about the sovereignty of God and how that works. And then you need to know, well, wait a minute. Are you saying God is sovereign so that people don't have free will? Well, I'm not exactly saying that. But I do know somewhere it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so he wouldn't let the Israelites go at the back end of this whole thing. Right? I do know that. 
And I do know that today, God softens people's hearts so they say yes to Jesus. Hmm. Free will can't mean exactly what you think it means, can it? Isn't that interesting? But God is never the author of sin. He's moving people around the chessboard, but he is not the author of sin. God cannot sin, will not sin, does not sin, and he doesn't author sin, but he tolerates it. He tolerates it. It's happening right now. You're living in a world full of sin. God could stop it in a second. It could stop it in one second. It could be all over, but he does not. There must be a reason, which is beyond our discussion this morning. Um, I don't think we got much more left in time. So a thing that you've got to keep in mind when you read these stories, number one, a lot of times there's repetition. Why? Because these stories were originally written for hearers, not for readers. People didn't read. They didn't have books. Codexes or books came later. Scrolls were very expensive, and usually only synagogues had scrolls. And so if you go into a synagogue today, they have scrolls. Some of them cost $50,000 each. And they have a little pointer that's made of silver where the person who reads, reads the scripture. But it's made for the hearing, not for the eyes. We have a great advantage. We can read as well as hear. So there's repetition. And the narrative often begins on the same note that it ends on, right? The, the beginning note of Joseph is, you guys are all going to bow down to me. By chapter 50, they're all bowing down to him. And then in 5020, he gives us a huge kernel of truth. It says this, and this goes into God's will and people's will. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That is an amazing statement about the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. It's an amazing statement. If you should memorize anything in the Bible, that would be one of the things to memorize. Um, <clears throat> next. Um, here are some things that you should know. Okay, there's like bullet points, okay? And I'll try to go through these quickly so you get them. Not everything God has said in the Bible is a direct word to you. Okay? No Bible narrative was specifically written about you, but it was written for you, and that's a difference. You must understand that. You could go a million different places with some of this stuff, and even preachers do, but they're wrong. And so if you go to a church that does that, you're going to be ultimately misled. I've seen it happen. I'm not saying that I'm the best Bible teacher in the world and I'm the only pastor in the world that does it right. But I'm saying there's a lot of people that do it wrong. I'm talking a lot. And so that's why you should, and you no exception here, but you should go to a church where a man's been prepared, not only by life, but by seminary. You know, um, I was talk, had this conversation the other day about a guy that wants to take a church but has no seminary training, no, no education. It's a dangerous thing. You know, there are people out, no one's like, you, know, you don't have to, my wife said that, well, doesn't he have a license? My sweet wife thinks that everybody, like, you know, everybody gets a license. You can't get a license to preach from the government. The government has no business in the church. So it's not like, you know, oh, you can drive, so we're giving you a driver's license. And no one goes up to the government and say, I'd like to preach. Can you give me a preaching license? No, only churches do that. 
right? And some churches give people licenses to preach that can't preach and are not studied. You can get one. You can you, you could become a minister this afternoon. You could send some money in, get a certificate, and tell them that you're whatever it is, licensed, ordained. But those people, ooh, it's going to be hard for them in the judgment. Because all teachers, including the one you're looking at, are going to be judged more strictly. I'm going to be judged more strictly for you on how I handle the word of truth. That's why I can't mess around. Now, the stories are not allegories. That's the first one, okay? Um, you shouldn't assume that this means that, that means this, this means that, right? The account of Moses going up and down Mount Sinai does not mean the allegory of a descent and ascent of the soul to God, which some people say. Elijah's battle with the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel is not an allegory over Jesus' triumph of the evil spirits. There's not this hidden code in the Bible with all this numerology and all this weirdness. That's a bunch of bunk, okay, guys? There's stuff you're going to have to unlearn. And that's the hardest thing, to unlearn something. And so you're going to have to unlearn that stuff if you got that in your heart. Decontextualizing, that's another thing. Sometimes people will concentrate on small units in a narrative and they'll miss the context and the clues that are given in the larger story. Sometimes people are selective. They just cherry pick certain phrases and words and make it mean what they want it to. Or they moralize it, you know? Like the Exodus is moral teaching about slavery. No, it's part of the history of redemption. And, the, you know, there are other narratives, or other principles maybe in the Bible about the issue, but you can't moralize. And that's the thing we do with our children. We have to be very careful of giving our children just moral education. Be good, Johnny. Don't be bad, Johnny. That's not enough. you got to teach your kids how to think, right? you got to know how to think, and you're going to know how to think biblically. It's a high calling. Parenting is not easy. I'm looking at the parent. This is the parent screen. You're the non-parent screen over here. Um, personalizing. Here's an example of personalizing. I love this. The story of Balaam's talking donkey reminds me that I talk too much. It's got nothing to do with that. <laughs> the story of building the temple is God's way of telling us that we have to build a new church building. Oh, how about misappropriation? Gideon throws out a fleece. This is a big one. Gideon throws out a fleece and people everywhere running around in circles saying, I tested the Lord today. I threw out a fleece. I said, God, if you give me $100 today, I will, you know, stop smoking cigarettes. You know, the Gideon's fleece is not something you were to imitate, actually. False appropriation. Jonathan and David had a very loving relationship. Jonathan and David kissed, okay? But they didn't kiss on the lips. They kissed on the cheek. Think of the mafia. If we were in the mafia this morning, you'd come in. Mike and I would come in. He'd kiss me on the cheek. I'd kiss him on the cheek. I'm telling you, these guys are men's men. They're not, you know, something else. But we have the people today thinking that because David and Jonathan did what they did, that they were homosexuals. They were not. They were men's men. It's a false appropriation. It's decontextualizing. Um, it's not wrong for a man and another man to be loving of one another. We're supposed to love everybody in the body of Christ, men and women, right? And loyally love them. And in kissing somebody in that context was a kiss on the cheek. I would kiss all of you on the cheek if this was a, a New Testament church in the, say, 200 A.D. 
Each time you'd come in, I'd kiss you on the cheek. Right? I wouldn't do that today. It might be weird. You, might go, you got something, man? Italian and French do that. The French. Italians still do it. The French still do it. I think it's still a beautiful thing. I just don't do it because it's not our culture. You know what I mean? And then there's false combinations. Taking, making a patchwork quilt out of stuff. Borrowing pieces from one narrative and then sticking it in another and you know or redefinition this means that that means this you have no warrant for that you know and so 10 last things i can say real quick an old testament narrative usually does not directly teach a doctrine indirectly maybe Number two, an Old Testament narrative usually illustrates a doctrine or doctrines taught propositionally elsewhere. Number three, narratives recorded what happened, which doesn't necessarily mean what should have happened, right? Let's say we taught about David and Bathsheba and said, yeah, that's what you should do when you Get a girl pregnant, you should make her your wife. Do everything you can. No, that's, that's not what it's saying. <laughs> you know? What people do in narratives, number four, is not necessarily the right thing to do. Gideon's fleece. David's actions. Joseph's actions in some places. His brother's actions. His father's actions. Right? Number five. Most of the characters in the Old Testament narratives are far from perfect, as are their actions. Number six, we're not always told at the end of the narrative what hap whether what happened was good or bad. We kind of got to figure it out. We're supposed to judge this on the basis of other scripture. Number seven, all narratives are selective. They don't give you every detail. Remember, the Bible's a theological book making a theological point, and it won't go beyond that theological point. I love that about the Bible. Number nine, narratives may teach there explicitly or implicitly, um, either clearly stating something, the thing David did displeased the Lord, or by implicitly saying something. And here's the big one. You ready? Number 10. In all of these narratives, all, God is the hero. Amen. 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 Yep. That's it, man. God is the hero. He's behind every page of the scripture, every writing. And these, these things just should thrill your soul as you read these things. And you realize, you know, these things that were happening with Joseph and his brothers are the foundation of your salvation. God would move heaven and earth to save your soul. And he did. And so that should say, all right, are you a little down today? Get lifted up. Are you a little down today? Are you feeling sorry for yourself? You don't think you're good enough? Well, Jesus thinks differently about you. God thinks a whole lot differently. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> you have to realize the infinite worth of your own soul, the infinite things he did because of the infinite worth of your soul. In the same way, we have to love souls, right? Sometimes in the church, we can get so cold to one another. We don't love souls, unsaved souls, saved souls, people in our church. Some people don't, I don't even know who's this guy. I don't know him. Know him. Go find out about him. Talk to him, you know? It's not like I'm supposed to be the tour director of the whole thing. You know what I mean? You're a church. Any questions that I can answer in the next, 26 seconds. You said that God uses things that happen to you that are bad. He didn't, he, 
allowed them to happen so good things can happen, even if things that happen to little kids. Yeah, even. But remember what he says, that whoever messes with a little kid is in a whole heap of terrible judgment unless they truly repent, right? The Christ says that in the New Testament. It's amazing. It's amazing. Hey, look at you know. There can be good that comes from it. Listen, when you mature as a Christian, you're going to learn one thing. That through bad stuff, good stuff happens. I'm telling you right now. I would not be in front of you if a lot of bad stuff didn't happen to me. Mm-hmm. I would not be here doing what I'm doing. I'd be somewhere else. Who knows where I'd be? In a gutter somewhere. <laughs> uh, so... So you, you have to remember that. And um, remember, Romans 8.28, it's not all things are good, but w- God works in all things together for your eternal good, if I can put it that way, as a Christian. Romans 8.28, recite that, know that, put that on your refrigerator, tattoo it on your arm if you're into that. No. <laughs> I'm not advocating that. Pastor, doesn't God um, put things like um, bad things in our lives to um, to get to know, you know, to get closer to Him and get to know Him yeah. better? Yes, they refine our faith. You remember the story about the uh, the, the what do you call it the the chrysalis, the moth, you know, he's in the he's in his little cocoon, and he's trying to he's trying to fly because he wants to be a butterfly, right? <clears throat> and he's like the stinking walls, like I can't get out of this, I can't, I, yeah. He's fighting and fighting, and so he fights, and what happens is all the strength comes into him, and fluids push out, and what happens is he becomes a butterfly as a result. And then one time what happened, right, the story is of the person was watching the chrysalis, you know, the struggle in the chrysalis. And so he came over with a pair of scissors and cut the cocoon open. And the moth plops out, can never fly, and dies. There's a lot of principles there. God wants you to persevere. The perseverance brings faith that's solid and also, parents can get a principle here. Mm-hmm. Don't give your kids everything. Let them struggle, for goodness sake. Make them work. How are they going to learn, right? right. Um, not that I would go to this extreme, but we had a guy that used to go to church here, and his father locked the doors when he turned 18. Really? Now, I think that's cold, but his, he basically came home when after his 18th birthday, tried the door, it didn't work. And so he had to go do it. Um, I wouldn't do that. I'm not that type of guy. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the opposite pole of the whole thing. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. And thank you, Lord, for these fine folks that have joined us. And we pray that they would have gleaned from this and that it would be of use and benefit to them. We pray for those watching uh, on YouTube as well. In Christ's holy name we ask, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.